Washington Journal continues. You probably know Jeff Weaver as the campaign manager for Senator Bernie Sanders 2016 presidential campaign. He's also now the author of the new book, How Bernie Won. Jeff Weaver, a C-SPAN viewer, might note that Senator Sanders had about uh, 1,900 delegates in the Democratic primary. Right. Hillary, Hillary Clinton, of course, about 2,800. So explain the title of your book. Yeah, so when we started the campaign back in uh, 2015, uh, Bernie was at 3% in the polls. He was talking about a lot of crazy ideas like Medicare for all, $15 minimum wage, free tuition at public colleges and universities. Uh, and as you can see now, those issues have really entered the mainstream of American politics. Uh, you know, he got 43% of the pledged delegates at the Democratic uh, National Convention, excited people across the country. Uh, uh, and now, you, you know, $15 minimum wage is passing everywhere. It's part of the Democratic Party platform. Free college at public colleges and universities is being, uh, you know, we're making steps toward it in places like New York and Rhode Island and other places. Uh, candidates for Medicare for All, I just saw a story that half of the candidates running for Congress on the Democratic side who have raised $1,000 or more have Medicare for All in their literature. So, you know, the debate uh, in this country is being won by the progressive side. Uh, the issues that Bernie talked about, which were considered to be out of the mainstream, are now in the center of the discussion here in America. When did you first meet Bernie Sanders? I first met Bernie Sanders back in 1986. I was a student at Boston University. I had been suspended for anti-apartheid protesting, uh, and I met him. He was running for governor in Vermont at the time uh, in a race that he ultimately got 14% of the vote in. And did you think you'd ever see him run for president when you first met him? I, <laughs> I did not. In fact, uh, you know, I've worked with him for most of my adult life, and I have to say until 2015, I don't think any of us expected him to run for president. So what was it? What, the success that you talk about in, in this book, what do you attribute it to? Look, there's a great hunger out in this country uh, for leadership that is going to make the lives of the American people better. You know, people can see themselves hurting, their communities are hurting, uh, and the same old uh, economics, the same old uh, politics is just not going to cut it. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, people chose to go with President Trump in the general election. I think in many cases there was a sense of desperation on people's part. Uh, but we've got to offer people an, an, a positive alternative uh, that really does address uh, the issues they see in their lives. The, the alternatives, the leadership that you're talking about, is that something only Bernie Sanders can give in 2020? No, I don't think that's the case. You know, if you look at uh, uh, most of the candidates who were talked about as leading Democratic candidates uh, for president, you know, they're talking about Medicare for all. They're talking about a lot of the issues uh, that Bernie Sanders uh, was talking about uh, in 2016 and before. I mean, Let's be clear, he's been talking about these issues for 30 years, uh, as long as I've known him. And I think one of the things that was, uh, one of the reasons he was so successful is that people out in the country sensed uh, rightly that he was an authentic messenger for the message he was delivering. We're talking with Jeff Weaver about his new book, How Bernie Won, came out uh, May 15th. And with us till about uh, 9 o'clock this morning, if you have questions or comments for Jeff Weaver, Democrats 202 748 8000, Republicans, 202-748-8001. Independence, 202-748-8002. Uh, talk about your role now and your relationship with Bernie Sanders. Yeah, so I'm a, a, an advisor to Bernie's uh, re-election campaign. He had just announced he's running for re-election in uh, 2018 to the U.S. Senate from Vermont. Uh, his, his first election to the Senate was in uh, 2006. Before that, he was a House member since 1990 or 1991 he was sworn in. Uh, and uh, as, as folks know who are you know tuned into politics, he has been traveling the country uh, supporting Democratic candidates up and down the ballot. Uh, he's been raising money for Democratic candidates and also talking about the issues. You know, he was a leader when President uh, Trump was first elected and uh, attempted to take the health insurance away from uh, tens of millions of people. It was Bernie Sanders who was traveling the country, rallying the nation against uh, that disastrous move. So the same with the tax bill. So. Uh, he's quite active uh, around the country, and I do a lot of work to, to support, support him in that. How are the candidates that he's supporting doing in their efforts in the midterm election? Yeah, they're actually doing uh, quite well. You know, there's been some reporting on this, which is not quite uh, accurate. But, you know, if you look at uh, lieutenant governor's race in Pennsylvania, you had a, a candidate, uh, John Fetterman, who uh, beat the incumbent a lieutenant governor in a, in a race. You know, all across this country, progressives uh, are winning. Talk about the Virginia governor's race, uh, considered one of the biggest races of last year. Uh, what happened with uh, with Bernie Sanders back candid there? Yeah, Tom Periello, who's a fantastic, uh, I just talked to Tom the other day. Um, look, that was a very difficult race. 
Uh, and one of the things people have to understand that a lot of politics comes down to resources. And uh, Tom Perello was out-resourced. Uh, the party, the establishment of the party in Virginia was firmly behind uh, uh, Ralph Northam. Uh, you know, Bernie Sanders supported Tom Perriello. Tom Perriello ran ads with Barack Obama in them. Uh, he didn't formally endorse in that race, but, you know, he did have Barack Obama in his ads, and there didn't seem to be any uh, concern from uh, uh, President Obama's world about it. So, you know, Tom was supported by a lot of folks, and it was just a case of uh, Ralph Northam had more institutional support, and he had, uh, and he had uh, more resources, and that's king in politics. How do you feel about the establishment of the Democratic Party, what, however you define that? Yeah, well, we could have a whole hour just talking what that means and what that is. But look, you know, I have a great relationship uh, with most of the folks in the what you would call the establishment of the Democratic Party, the DNC. Uh, I served on a, what was called a Unity Reform Commission that was formed out of the Democratic National Convention last time. It had uh, Clinton appointees, Sanders appointees, and DNC appointees, and we have a package of reforms that were unanimously supported. Uh, you know, the chair of the uh, party, Tom Perez, uh, is helping to push those reforms forward. So are there still some uh, more conservative elements in the establishment which uh, apparently don't understand that, you know, you need to respond to the people of the country? Yes, there are. But I think that, uh, by and large, there's a significant movement in the right direction. Who are those folks who, who's leading that in the Democratic Party right now? What, what's that? The reaction? Yeah, the, the barriers that you were just talking about. Look, I don't think that it's really tied around any one person. I think there are a group of people who have, are, you know, longtime uh, members of the DNC and others who, uh, and many of those people really don't have a, a lot of uh, interaction with uh, politics in an electoral sense. When you talk to Democrats in the quote-unquote establishment who, who actually uh, are involved in electoral politics, who have to go out and talk to voters every couple of years or in support of candidates who are uh, running every couple of years, you know, they have a much different view, a much more, uh, they're much more open to the kind of change that we need. Larry's up first this morning, calling in from L.A. We're talking with Jeff Weaver, former campaign manager to Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential run. Uh, Larry, go ahead. Yes, yes. Good, good morning. Uh, I really appreciate C-SPAN, uh, John. And uh, Mr. Weaver, I can uh, appreciate you as well. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you much. You can call me Jeff, too, <laughs> along with the other callers as well. Okay, Jeff. I have a, a question or two, and, I, and I'd like to really know uh, what you think. If Hillary had selected Bernie Sanders as her running mate and, uh, you know, got along, you know, made nice with him, you know, after all the campaign rhetoric, do you think, what do you think the possibility uh, of a Hillary Sanders ticket uh, in terms of winning uh, that election would have been? And I'll take my, my answer offline. I've often thought that if she had, you know, chosen Bernie, you know, the, the impetus that he had created with his campaign and the voters and the interest that he had, you know, uh, created could have overcome any of the issues that came up with, you know, the Comey thing and all of that. And I just want to know what your impression was. And maybe... Larry, thanks for the question. We'll let Jeff Weaver answer. Yeah, the, uh, you know, there are a lot of, and I'm sure we'll get a lot of these, what I call the sort of crystal ball questions or the time machine questions, right? If you could go back in time and rewind and do something different. And obviously, you know, having worked in a campaign that was ultimately not successful in securing the nomination, although successful in other ways, you know, you often go back and think, well, what if, what if we had done this? What if we had done that? And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to speak for the Clinton uh, folks. You know, I know many of them now, having worked with them in the general election. You know, Bernie was a very active campaigner for Secretary Clinton across the country, as was I. And, um, but, you know, what they have said many times in public is that, you know, because the race was so close in so many places, probably one or two changes of various things would have uh, sort of tipped it uh, the other way. And one of the things that they mentioned is, is uh, at a symposium I was at with them was that if they had picked Bernie that probably would have flipped it the other way along with some other possible changes. What are some other what ifs that that you think about that you talk about in this book that you would have done differently if you could do it again? Yeah, I, what was amazing about the campaign was you know he started he had a, a press conference in the Senate swamp to announce his presidential bid kind of a, a, a unconventional uh, approach. Explain what that is for so folks it's who don't a, know. it's an area outside the Senate where senators typically have press conferences and uh, the media is there but it's not uh, there's not a huge public presence. And, you know, usually people announce their candidacy for president with huge fanfare. He sort of came out with a typewritten speech, gave it, and walked back in and went back to work. Uh, and, uh, like I said, pretty unconventional. You know, he followed it up with a formal announcement in, in uh, May where we had 5,000 people out in, in Burlington, Vermont, which is a relatively small city. But 
Um, you know, one of the, the, the biggest problems we had was not knowing the level of support that we would have in terms, particularly in terms of people's genero generosity. So we were looking at budgeting for a $30 million presidential campaign, which sounds like a lot of money, but in presidential politics is very, very little. And at the end of the day, we raised $230 million. Uh, and so, you know, our campaign in terms of its growth was very small at the beginning. Uh, and we had to really accelerate it. There was a point at which we hired a thousand people in 90 days in the fall of 2015. So, uh, you know, if we had known what was unknowable, uh, that we would have all this generous support, I think we, our campaign would have been structured differently earlier. And the other thing I think, which we talk about in the book, is the extent to which Bernie's campaign really represented a continuation of the New Deal policies of, uh, of uh, FDR. Uh, if you look at his 1944 State of the Union uh, address where he talks about the unfinished business of the country and the Democratic Party, you know, if you read it, it's like a laundry list of what Bernie Sanders was talking about in 2016. If you had done more to, to prepare for, the, for that growth that you're talking about, do you think that that would have done something to diminish the, the sort of uh, spark that, that formed around the, the Sanders campaign? Well, no, I mean, I don't talk, I'm not talking about preparing in sort of a, a calculating way. What I'm saying is, so he announced at the end of April, by the end of July, we had 28 staff people nationwide. That includes staff in Iowa and New Hampshire, which were the first two contests. Uh, you know, Secretary Clinton had hundreds of people by that time. So uh, just in terms of building the campaign infrastructure, uh, we would have done that much earlier had we known we were going to have those kinds of resources. James in New York, line for Democrats. Go ahead. Yes, um, I am a Hillary Clinton supporter. Bernie and your group have delusional math. She won clearly the Democratic nomination, but you try to pretend she didn't. She should have been president. She should have been president instead of Obama. But here's the deal. I used to be a Democrat, and I intend to in join the Republican Party, and I will support everything that Trump has done. And he will get reelected, and in four more years, you will have a country that's even more angry and more divided, and he will get his agenda of supporting extremist right-wing uh, judges and attorney generals, and it'll be your fault. So, James, why is that something that you want to vote for? Because Bernie had no business running. He had no business running. Hillary had paid her dues. It was her time. She won every every minority by a, a a great margin, greater than Obama. And now I'm just tired. And uh, this is garbage. Jeff Weaver. Okay. Well, uh, I would hope that you would not uh, jump ship and go with the Republicans, especially if you if you find their positions to be repugnant. But uh, look, let me just say this. You know, Bernie Sanders is part of the Senate Democratic leadership. Uh, he runs with the endorsement of the Vermont Democratic Party. In fact, they just put out a resolution uh, last week uh, declaring him a Democrat. Um, you know, he raises millions and millions of dollars for down-ballot Democratic candidates. He, he did in the 2016 election cycle. I think it was over $5 million that he uh, raised for down-ballot Democrats. You know, he received 43% of the vote in the Democratic primary process. How can you say that Democratic voters shouldn't have that, that shot? And, I, I, you know, the other point I would say is, I'm a big believer in voters being the ultimate arbiters of who's the candidate of the party. Uh, and I think, you know, given the outcome of 43 percent of the vote, that uh, voters, many voters in the Democratic Party wanted a different selection. There's no, there's no doubt that Secretary Clinton had paid her dues and was, you know, certainly, I mean, an impeccable resume to be president of the United States. There's no doubt about that. You know, they have argued the most qualified ever. Uh, that, that's, you know, a fair, a fair position on their part. And, uh, you know, we also wanted her to win, frankly, at the end. You know, Bernie Sanders went from one end of this country to the other. I was on TV all the time on the networks, uh, you know, advocating for Secretary Clinton's election. So, you know, we have elections. Uh, people come away with hard feelings. Uh, but that's what democracy is about. Let the voters decide. If you had to say today, will voters get another chance to vote for Bernie Sanders in 2020? Well, voters in Vermont certainly will coming up in November. Uh, n nationally, you know, he is uh, considering another run for, for the presidency. And... Uh, you know, when the time comes, I think we'll have an answer to that. But right now, he's he's still considering it. Donald in New York, line for independence. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. Uh, first off, I'd like to say I'm sorry I do not have a computer, so I can't get the actual numbers. However, the vote last week in the Senate on the Veterans Mission Bill, uh, I don't know that I know it was a very big majority voted for it. However, 
late in the vote, before it was getting the time to end, Bernie Sanders rushed onto the floor, voted no, and rushed off the floor. Now, I'm a veteran, and I think every veteran in this country should be aware of what this man did and any potential future that he might have in political office should be wiped out just because of that vote. And even all the young millennials who have veterans in their family uh, should inform the people of what he did. And if people can get on and see that vote and see the group of Democrats that voted against it, Every one of these people should be voted out of office, and the head of that should be Bernie Sanders. And I'll wait for your comment. I'll I'll let Jeff Weeper respond, but I'll give you the numbers. It was a 92 to 5 vote in the Senate. Uh, The proposal called the VA Mission Act, I believe, is what you're referring to. The only uh, only senators who voted against it, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii, Senator Merkley of Oregon, uh, a Democrat, Senator Mike Rounds, Republican of South Dakota, uh, Senator Bob Corker, Republican of Tennessee. Yeah, so uh, people people will remember that actually Bernie and John McCain uh, a few years ago uh, actually uh, worked together to create uh, the largest reform uh, and improvement in veterans' health care in a generation. Uh, the bill that you're talking about, I think there was a, a big concern uh, that the bill wanted to lead to more privatized health care for uh, veterans. You know, Bernie has been a, a longtime advocate for increasing resources for the VA. Uh, expanding the VA system so that we get deal with these issues of waiting lines. I know when I worked for him on the Hill many years ago, you know, he worked very hard to establish uh, veterans community centers, uh, community health centers around the, country, the state so that uh, veterans wouldn't have to travel so far. Uh, but some on the other side want to dismantle the VA. They want to push the veterans into the private health care system, uh, leave them to the vagaries of uh, private insurance. Uh, and Bernie Sanders has never supported that. And so he will continue to fight for the VA. Uh, if he has to be the only person out there fighting to make sure veterans have the health care they deserve, uh, that's what he'll do. And certainly that concern about moving too far in the direction of privatization uh, is what Senator Sanders uh, cited in his statement about voting no on the bill that the viewer talked about. Gary is in Connersville, Indiana, line for Democrats. Go ahead. Yeah, that's right. This is Gary Seaver from Connersville, Indiana. I'm the voice of the common man. I'm here to take a stand. And the first thing I want to talk about is that thing that last caller said about the vote. Well, let me tell you what. Bill Clinton dies the draft. He was elected twice to president. And if this, I'm going to tell you, Mr. Weaver, I appreciate the fact that you represent one of the greatest presidents, uh, candidates for president that ever was, in my personal estimation. And uh, personally, I would have retitled that book, um, Why Bernie Should Have Won. But... This man is all for, um, like, for one example, the unions, and uh, all these Republican governors want to use this uh, anti-union um, legislation to call They call it right, right to work, right to work under BS conditions, what I call it. But I have one concern, sir, okay? May I make it quick? Um, the Republican Party does seem to be a very powerful entity, you know, with all the, with all the resources and everything. And uh, it, I find it a little discouraging, you know. I mean, it's, it's like we're, we're, we're like a mouse trying to find a grizzly bear, you know. Um, is there really, I mean, now is there any hope, you think? I mean, I think more voters would help, hint, hint. But uh, I just find it rather uh, unsettling, you know, because they, they got power, dude. So uh, if, there's, if there's any way you can, like, um, if you can make me feel any better, tell me different, man. Is there any hope at all? Just Gary, got your point. That's Gary, the voice of the com- common man. That's in right. Well, and, and thanks for the call. Uh, yes, there is hope. I, you know, uh, I, I try not to do a futile things in my life, and uh, I, I do think there's hope. I mean, you know, the point, he, a couple of points that, uh, from what Gary said, uh, you know, the Republicans do have a tremendous amount of resources. Obviously, uh, most of uh, uh, the corporate elite in this country and the, and the very wealthy are supporting of the Republican Party, and the reason for that is you see with the Republican tax bill a huge giveaway of, of resources to the rich and the powerful in this country. Uh, and the other thing that Gary uh, raised, which I think is critical, he talked about there being need to be more voters. And what we're seeing across this country is in state after state an effort by Republican uh, governors and legislators 
uh, to roll back uh, voting protections to exclude more and more people from the polls, particularly uh, poor people and mi people uh, minorities, young people. Uh, and what we've got to do is we've got to fight and keep fighting to make sure that everybody who is entitled to vote gets to vote. CC Atlanta, Georgia, line for Democrats. Go ahead. CC, you with us? Stay by your phone, CC. Al is in Darlington, South Carolina, Republican. Al, go ahead. Yeah, we're conservatives, but uh, it's not just because of our views. It's because of, we're fiscal conservatives. And Bernie Sanders, you know, a lot of guys and people just say, hey, we want Bernie because he's going to pay for everything. But you got to be able to pay for this. How does Bernie expect to pay for everyone's college and everyone's Medicare? I mean, he offers no explanation for paying for it. Well, that's a good point. You know, Bernie Sanders was a small city mayor. That's how he started in electoral office. Uh, uh, was an eight-term mayor, never raised the, uh, the, the property tax rate, uh, you know, ex greatly expanded government services uh, at the same time, uh, really uh, squeezed a lot of uh, excess uh, waste uh, out of uh, the previous administration's uh, programs. But let me say this. Uh, you know, in the presidential campaign, every program that he advocated for, we provided to pay for uh, free college uh, tuition at public colleges and universities, which you know all of our democratic allies do around this uh, world. You know he wanted to put a tax on Wall Street speculation, which would raise the money. Uh, in terms of Medicare for all, uh, it's not a question of more money in our system. It's the question of uh, spreading the money around uh, in a way that is, is going to wring out the uh, excesses and waste that you have from the private insurance industry. Uh, so we're really not talking about huge amounts of extra money to insure everybody, because we already spend. Uh, in, in most cases, more than twice as much as our Democratic allies do uh, per person on health care, and we in most cases have worse outcomes than they do. So it's a question of redesigning the health care system so that everybody has access to health care uh, and, and, again, squeezing out some of the waste that we see in the current system. Going back to the book, How Bernie Won Inside the Revolution That's Taking Back Our Country and Where We Go From Here, uh, as you think back to the, the 2016 campaign, where did you see the intersection between Donald Trump supporters and Bernie Sanders supporters. Uh, I remember on this program uh, during the primaries, we had plenty of callers who would call in and say, if Bernie Sanders doesn't win the Democratic primary, then I'm going to go vote for Trump. Right. Well, you know, it certainly are uh, some of those uh, folks. And, uh, you know, there's been uh, some reporting on this around the country, you know, folks who voted for Bernie or supported Bernie and then uh, voted for Trump. Uh, you know, there was also a lot of following reporting, you know, how many people who supported Secretary Clinton in 2008 then voted for John McCain and not Barack uh, Obama. So, you know, th th this is open to some discussion. There obviously are some people who voted for Bernie who then voted for Trump or didn't vote at all. Uh, you know, we were certainly out there beating the bushes trying to get them to uh, stay with the team and to vote for the secretary. Um, you know, there are a lot of working class people in this country who, you know, are, are it's it's tough. You know, if you look at the... the uh, Exit polling and some of the other research, you know, 13 percent of black men voted for Trump, uh, 20, maybe 20 percent, maybe 20 percent of Latinos in this country voted for Trump, despite uh, all of his uh, uh, bigoted rhetoric. Um, uh, there's a desperation on the world. When you get outside the Washington bubble and you actually go out where people live, uh, folks are having a hard time and they're looking for solutions and they don't want to hear about the same old, same old. Unfortunately, uh, what was presented to them by this, the president's sort of snake oil campaign uh, hasn't really come to pass. How much do you credit the, the spark that was the, the Bernie Sanders uh, support during the primaries to the, the policy positions that he was talking about, and then how much to simply being anti the establishment, and again, however you define that? Yeah, yeah, look, you know, clearly there are people out there who want change in this country, but I mean, you can see it. And, and, you know, our, our campaign deserves some credit, but look, there are also, you know, sort of growing social movements in this country, uh, some of which intersected with our campaign and some of which are independent. The Women's March we saw here in D.C., Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, obviously was a, uh, a movement that, uh, grew, you know, grew out of the excesses of police violence. Uh, you, you know, you see the, the activity of the Dreamers, uh, you, you know, around immigrant rights. So there are all these social movements that are springing up uh, around the country. And uh, it's really exciting uh, time to be uh, in politics in America. Tim, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, Republican. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning. Thank you for C-SPAN. Uh, Jeff, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, how do you feel about Hillary Clinton rigging the, the Democratic uh, uh, election there for, for Bernie? 
So, you know, we discuss, you know, I discussed this obviously uh, quite a bit in the book. It was obviously a topic of some uh, controversy, shall we say, during the campaign. You know, at various times it was clear that the, the DNC and the person of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was the chair at the time, uh, you know, was pushing, uh, putting their fingers on the scale to help Secretary Clinton. There's no doubt about that. Donna Brazile, who was also, he was the acting chair of the DNC after Debbie Wasserman Schultz in her book, you know, described how there was an agreement, a uh, signed document between the DNC and the Clinton campaign, effectively giving uh, the Clinton campaign veto power over the DNC as early as the summer of 2015. Uh, so there are a number of instances, the debate schedule, uh, joint fundraising agreements, uh, on and on, and, you know, these are detailed uh, in the book. So, uh, you know, am I happy about it? No, I'm not. You know, but uh, as I mentioned before, there's a Unity Reform Commission, and one of the mandates of this commission is to try to remedy uh, some of these problems so that this never happens again. Uh, and one of the biggest steps we can take uh, to democratize the process is the elimination of these so-called superdelegates who are either party officials or electeds uh, who get to vote at the convention uh, by virtue of their position not having been elected as a delegate to the convention uh, by anybody. And if you look at them in the aggregate, if you, if you, you know, they have more votes than 25 states in the District of Columbia combined. So, uh, Is that going to happen? Uh, we're, we're working on it, and there's a lot of uh, movement at the grassroots, and frankly, within uh, the Democratic Party itself. As I mentioned before, you know, a lot of folks at the DNC who are involved in electoral politics understand that we have got to democratize the process to keep faith with the American people. What is the pushback that you get? What is the argument for superdelegates? Well, the argument for superdelegates is that, well, we need this as a, as a check to make sure that the people don't make the wrong decision. But, you know, in a democracy, by definition, the people should be making the decision, make the decision. And if you look empirically, look, I don't support Trump or anything he does, right? But he was elected in a, in a process that, where there were no superdelegates, right? The people chose. Uh, in, our pro, in the Democratic Party, in our process, your superdelegates played a huge role, uh, and they empirically produced the more electable candidate, right? I mean, he won. What's your relationship like with Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Donna Brazil today? I don't have a lot of communication with Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Uh, Donna Brazil, I you know talk to quite frequently, as a matter of fact. Joe, Oklahoma City, line for Republicans. Go ahead. Uh, hi guys, I'm so honored to be talking with Jeff. Uh, thank you so much for all of your efforts, and everyone out here in America loves Bernie. I think some of the people that didn't like Bernie had this kind of fear of socialism when they don't realize even their local fire departments are based on everybody paying a little tax and having a fire department when you need one that's not provided by the private industry, um, which would probably cost you about 25000 to put out a small kitchen fire. Um, so his idea is basically just to take greed out of our health care system, which is basically ripping all of us off. Um, as far as the DNC and the DCCC, I think we can't be too light on their actions to kind of uh, basically put their fingers still on the scales in these primaries where you see the DCCC pushing what I would call a Wall Street pick uh, versus a progressive. They're still kind of leaning towards the money. And I will close with this. To me, the swamp is the moneyed interest that's basically owning and running our state and federal governments. Uh, the one thing about Bernie is he will drain that swamp. Uh, Trump has five Goldman Sachs guys working for him. Lobbyists are actually directly running agencies now, like Scott Pruitt. Um, so I think until we drain the swamp, i.e. get money out of the federal government from it coming before the people's, what the people's dreams and hopes are, and, and Obama was bad with this too, we have to get Wall Street out of running our government, or it's never going to work for the people. And Trump hasn't drained the swamp. He's filled it to the brim with raw sewage. Joe, let me Thank ask you. you real quick before you go. You're calling in on our line for Republicans. Why are you a Republican? Oh, no, sir. I called in on your Democrat line and confirmed it with your caller. But I will tell you honestly. Well, I Joe, voted... let's let Jeff Weaver respond. Well, look, Joe, a Democrat. <laughs> well, look, I appreciate the, the uh, kind words uh, from the caller. Uh, Look, in terms of money and politics, I mean, that is, you know, a major crux of the problems in this country is the extent to which moneyed interests uh, control uh, the government uh, and control politics in this country. You know, they pour uh, billions of dollars into it to get the candidates they want elected. And you see things, uh, you know, he talks about local fire departments. You know, many communities, 
uh, people are having trouble paying for schools, are having trouble paying for fire departments, for police protection, uh, for all the other things that local governments do. At the same time, you know, Trump is giving away you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars to wealthy campaign contributors. It, it really is outrageous. About uh, 25 minutes left with Jeff Weaver, his new book, How Bernie Won Inside the Revolution That's Taking Back Our Country and Where We Go From Here. Democrats can join the conversation at 202-748-8000. Republicans, 202-748-8001. Independents, 202-748-8002. want to focus on independence for sure. uh, just a second. You mentioned Bernie Sanders' 1988 campaign, a passage from your book uh, and, and that race with Bernie Sanders. Even though Bernie lost in 1988, he set down an important political marker. He had shown that in Vermont, he was the viable alternative to the Republicans and that the third place finishing Democrat had in fact been the spoiler. Throughout 1986 and 88, Bernie had had to contend with the constant media narrative that he was going to be responsible for electing the Republican by taking away Democratic votes. Uh, talk about the, the status of independent bids in the wake of what Bernie Sanders did in 2016. Right, right. So, it, you know, there are uh, in, running outside the two-party system is very, very difficult uh, to do, as, as you well know. Uh, it is rarely successful. Bernie Sanders is the longest-serving independent in the Congress. Uh, but, he, you know, in many ways, he's the exception that proves uh, the rule. And, uh, you know, I think as we have seen the rise of Trumpism and extremism in the Republican Party, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders has worked closer and closer with the Democratic Party, obviously, um, you know, running as a presidential candidate. Like I said, he runs with the endorsement of the Vermont Democratic Party, uh, raises money for Democrats. So uh, it is very, very difficult to uh, run outside the system. That being said, you know, Bernie has an inc incredible credibility with, uh, uh, with uh, independent voters. In those uh, primaries, Democratic primaries and caucuses where independents could participate, which is most of them, frankly, in this country. You know, he was winning those voters uh, three to one, four to one, in some cases five to one against Secretary Clinton. And that was, uh, you know, one of the reasons why the public polling showed him so strong in general election matchups against Trump, and frankly, and every other Republican, uh, is because of his strength with independent voters. For a national campaign, can an independent truly run outside the two-party system, or do they have to capture one of the parties to be successful. Yeah, I mean, to win the presidency, I, I think it's virtually impossible for someone to win out, out, run outside the two-party system and win at this point in our history. David's an independent uh, in Virginia. Go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks, C-SPAN, for taking my call. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for appearing on the program today. My question is, in the election 2016, three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and uh, uh, Miss, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania all went to Trump, but the voter, vote between Trump and Hillary was less than the amount of votes that Jill Stein got. And do you think, because of the way the DNC treated Bernie, that a lot of Bernie supporters went for Jill Stein because they couldn't support Hillary or Trump? Thank you. Look, there's always going to be a certain number of voters who vote for third-party candidates, whether it's Jill Stein on the left or whether it's Libertarian on the right. Uh, that happens in every election. Obviously, the most famous case is the Ralph Nader in Florida uh, in 2000. Uh, but, you know, this is part of the struggle that any general election candidate has is, you know, you have to build a coalition. It's not everybody who's supporting you is not going to align with you perfectly on your issues. And you do have to reach out. And I think the Clinton campaign uh, during the general election campaign did try to reach out. Uh, and certainly Bernie tried to uh, help her in that regard uh, by traveling right. the country. Claudia, Tallahassee, Florida, line for Democrats. Go ahead. I think that um, Bernie killed the election for Hillary. Uh, I'm disappointed that he ran as a as an independent and a democratic primary, it was a pro that was a real problem for me. Uh, I think that Bernie had a too much bluster. Claudia, you're going in and out. Uh, Jeff Weaver, did you want to take anything from that? Yeah, I mean, I, once in a while you hear, and I, and, uh, I hear what Claudia's saying. You know, there are there are a. I would say a relatively small minority. I'm going to get destroyed now on social media by the sort of neoliberal uh, bots and sock puppets, but I will say this. There is a very, very small uh, number of people in the Democratic Party who say Bernie should not have run in the Democratic Party presidential 
to those people, I would say, did you really want him running outside the Democratic Party uh, for President of the United States? In which case, you would have guaranteed the election of a Republican. So, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a uh, ridiculous position. Now, you know, there are people who do not agree with Bernie Sanders' politics. I get that. Uh, even some Democrats. Uh, and really what they want is for him to go away. But he represents, you know, a, a, a large and growing part of the Democratic uh, Party. You know, young people uh, voted for him four to one, five to one, uh, six to one in some cases. Uh, he won millennials of every race in this country. Uh, and, you know, by the end of the campaign, we're winning uh, people under 40 of every race in this country. So uh, the wing of the party that he represents, a wing which is increasingly becoming the entire bird, uh, is, the, is the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, he articulated a vision which excited uh, particularly young people. Uh, and if we're going to have a party that grows uh, and has a future, we need to bring those young people in, and we need to listen to them. Jerry in Ohio, line for independence. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, C-SPAN. Thanks for taking my call. Mr. Weaver, uh, I'm a Vietnam disabled veteran. You talked about the VA and Bernie's idea on it and stuff and privatizing it, whatever. I live clear out in the country. I'm 35 miles from my VA clinic. At that clinic, they do very little. And the hospital that they want to send me to, the VA hospital, is 90 miles away. I can no longer drive that far. I need surgery right now. And they said I have to go to the VA hospital in Columbus, which is 100 miles away, or Dayton, which is 140 miles away. I can't do that. So my, my, my deal is I, I, need, I need privatized insurance for the VA to pay for because the, the closest hospitals around here are like 40 miles from my house. Ain't nothing any closer that can do me any good. The VA hospital they sent me to one time called me. I've been there four times over the years. All four times I've been dissatisfied with the care, with the diagnosis, with the treatment. They called me and said I had an appointment for a test. Two hours later they called me back and said, uh, you don't have an appointment for that test because we don't do that test here. Now, how much confidence do I have in the VA system when I get treated like that? Look, uh, uh, the challenge we have uh, is that veterans, you know, have served this country, uh, injured in the service of their country, uh, have earned benefits, uh, and that debt to them should be honored. Uh, I grew up in a rural place as well. I know many veterans who have had to travel uh, to get the care that, to which they're entitled. Uh, and that's wrong. But the answer to that is not to privatize and dismantle the VA. Uh, the answer to that is to put the resources into the VA so that veterans get the care that they need, uh, which is geographically uh, accessible to them. Why are you so worried about privatization of the VA? Look, the VA provides, uh, obviously provides health care, but it also has a research function. Uh, they have doctors who specialize in many of the types of injuries uh, uh, that veterans have been exposed to. Uh, and it provides a, a centralized way to deal with veteran-specific uh, problems. You look at Gulf War illness, which was uh, an illness which affected 100,000 Americans from the first Gulf War. Uh, you know, without the VA getting this, the specialized uh, care that is needed and the research out through the private system, much more difficult than getting it out uh, through the VA process. Uh, and you really what this is, is, is Republicans, they always want the next war, but they never want to pay for the cost of the last war. Another Jerry is waiting in Sewell, New Jersey. Democrat, go ahead. Hi, um, I have a couple of questions for you, uh, but I do want to comment about the VA. Uh, first of all, you're exaggerating. They're not trying to get rid of the VA. The alternative is to give these people that, like the previous caller, that doesn't have the opportunity to go to where he needs to go, he can be able to have an alternative and go to private care. So you're kind of exaggerating about getting rid of the VA because that's not going to happen. But the three questions I have for you are, one, is your lawsuit against the DNC still active, or did you drop it? Two, um, oh, God, let's go. Oh, I understand that Bernie Sanders got a lakeside home, a third vacation home, when he dropped uh, going after Hillary Clinton and supporting Hillary Clinton during the election. So I'm curious about that. Did, and what's going on with the FBI investigation against his wife? So those 
A lot of questions there. Jeff Weaver. Sure. So suit against the DNC, uh, we filed suit in December of 2015 to get access to uh, data that we had put into a centralized data bank that the DNC was uh, withholding. Uh, that suit has long been dismissed because the, you know, we reached uh, an agreement with them to get access back to the data. So that's question one. So that suit is uh, long gone. Uh, Bernie Sanders does have a uh, v vacation home, uh, which he recently acquired uh, uh, on Lake Champlain in Vermont. Um, you know, he had a very, he had a very successful uh, book, uh, and uh, believe me, as a member of Congress, he leads a very uh, humble lifestyle. I can tell you that. Uh, there's plenty of pictures you see in the media all the time of him walking his shirts to the cleaners or uh, in the grocery store. Does his own grocery shopping in Vermont. Drives his little car to get his own groceries. So. Um, and then, uh, you know, th this uh, uh, look into Jane Sanders. Jane Sanders was the president of Burlington College, uh, which ended up long after she left uh, having uh, financial problems. As I understand it, that uh, they're still looking at it. Uh, I've known Jane Sanders now for 30 years. Um, you know, the, the problem is, is, you know, when you, when you run a school or a business and then you leave and, you know, half a decade later has problems, everybody likes to point the fingers at somebody who used to be there, frankly. What is the group Our Revolution? So our revolution is a uh, C4 nonprofit uh, that uh, came out of, is, is inspired by Bernie Sanders' run for president. Uh, they support uh, progressive candidates up and down the ballot uh, in a number of ways. Uh, they also uh, support local people who are trying to democratize their local Democratic Party. A headline from Politico recently, Bernie's army in disarray, the Sanders-inspired grassroots group Our Revolution is flailing. Uh, an extensive review by Politico showing uh, concerns about uh, a potential 2020 bid. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I, you know, they've been uh, pretty successful. I think they have a 40 some odd percent success rate in the candidates they support, uh, which is phenomenal uh, given the difficulty that progressive candidates have in terms of running well-funded campaigns. Uh, I think they're doing a lot of good work over there. Uh, they certainly have carried on uh, what was a very uh, important a tactic that we used in the campaign, which was distributed organizing, which is using the internet uh, to activate volunteers across the country to help in races even where they did not live. Uh, you know, they've continued uh, that, and uh, you know, they've done some really good work over there. Are you and are is Bernie Sanders directly involved with this group? No, I was the president of it uh, shortly after it was uh, formed. I left there in uh, 2017. Uh, Why'd you leave? Uh, I went back to work for Bernie. Uh, you know, the organization was new. Uh, I, I came in to sort of get it up and running, and uh, it's doing great. Senator Anita Turner uh, is the president of it now, uh, doing an outstanding job. And, uh, you know, I went back, to, as I said, to work directly uh, for Bernie. And Bernie is not directly involved with it. That would be a violation of uh, Senate ethics rules. One concern from the Politico story, board members and uh, Sanders presidential delegates from 2016 have ra raised questions about whether Nina Turner is using her position to prepare for a presidential run of her own and to settle scores with the Democratic National Committee from 2016. What would you say to that? Yeah, you know, this is one of those typical sort of gossipy, backbiting articles with a lot of uh, anonymous sources. Uh, you know, Senator Turner is over there, I think, doing the hard work of organizing around this uh, country, and uh, that's difficult work. And so, you know, are you going to please all the people all the time? No, you're not. Do I think she's using it as a platform to run for president? No, I don't. That's a kind of ridiculous. About 15 minutes left with Jeff. We were talking about his book, How Bernie Won. If you want to join the conversation, again, phone lines for Democrats, Republicans, and independents. We'll get to as many of your calls as we can. Jennifer, thanks for waiting in St. Petersburg, Florida, line for Republicans. Go ahead. Thank you very much for taking my call. I, when, I have two things I'd like to bring up. I'm not a Bernie fan, but I do like to listen to the other ideas to see what we can gain. I don't like the fact that Bernie encouraged violence when he was in his campaign thing, and that a number of the incidents that were happening to both Hillary and Trump's rallies were being caused by the infidels that Bernie was in encouraging. The other part of this I'd like to address, though, is the Constitution wanted the United States to be diverse and wanted us to be a sanctuary place for those who were suffering from things like the Nazi movement in Germany. It has been incredibly distorted, and now we have people with this M13 group coming in under any guise in order to kill our young women. I would like to say this. We are also not to be designed to be the back, back door or the suburb for all the South American countries. We are no longer becoming diverse. We are becoming incredibly tilted towards only one group of people in the world. 
And I'd like to see our government change that. And Jennifer, before Jeff Weaver mm-hmm. jumps in, uh, on your first issue on the encouraging violence, what what do you remember from the campaign specifically of, of Bernie Sanders encouraging violence? What's a, an incident that you recall? At the end of a number of his talks, he would say, be sure you're heard. Be sure that you are not denied your voice. Scream louder, scream louder, get present, be there. And that was taken to the nth degree by the people that he was saying it to, and I think he should have realized that. Jeff Weaver. Well, I'm not aware of it. I'm not. This is, the, this is news to me. I was at most of those speeches. Actually, I don't remember that line. Uh, but, um, look, Bernie Sanders activated uh, a whole new generation of, of voters in this country, um, excited people across the country. Um, you know, in fact, it was, the, it was President Trump who was at his rallies encouraging people to beat people up. I mean, that is well documented and saying he would pay their legal bills. I don't know whether I'm going to beat them up or so. I'm going to have somebody else beat them up. These are the lines that the president used. Uh, you know, our, our rallies were great, you know, peaceful rallies, uh, but lots of people, um, tens and tens of thousands of people in some cases, 30,000 people in New York City, 30,000 people in L.A. Um, uh, the immigration uh, issue was the other issue she brought up. Look, uh, first of all, I don't use the term infidels. It suggests some kind of uh, superiority on my part, and some, that somehow other people are damned. Uh, but l- let me let me let me say this: uh, We are a diverse country. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of being a diverse country. Um, you know, I grew up in a very white place uh, in America, and now live in a much more diverse place. Uh, there are great people in all races, all creeds, all genders, gender identities, sexual orientations, and I think, you know, the sooner people just come to grips with the fact that, you know, the world is changing, uh, um, the better off they'll be. And let me just say this about uh, immigrant community. I think, you know, what we just saw in France with the uh, French spire man, the man who, who uh, climbed the, the building to save the young child, you know, who is an undocumented person uh, in France, uh, reminds us that superheroes do walk among us. Uh, people may not know that I own a comic book store in Northern Virginia as well. Um, but, you know, we're reminded that, you know, great acts of heroism and... Uh, uh, come out of every community, uh, and the, the, the contribution that uh, uh, immigrants are making to this country, including undocumented people, uh, is phenomenal, and uh, I, I think we should be uh, more welcoming of our neighbors, frankly. Well, why do you own a comic book store? So I was a lot, <laughs> why do I own a comic book? Well, I do like comic books. Uh, I left politics, actually, in 2009. I was Bernie's Senate Chief of Staff. I left politics to uh, do something different. I opened a comic book store to have it sort of uh, more laid-back lifestyle. It's actually a tough business. Uh, people will be interested to hear, or maybe not. Uh, but I was caught when he called me back in 2015, and I, it's difficult for me to say no to Bernie, so I, I left that to, to uh, run the presidential campaign. Audrey's in Philly, line for independence. Go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Weaver, I'd like to say thank you for all the hard work you did. I just finished reading your book a few days ago. I thought it was great, and I thought it was a good title. Because I hope Bernie runs in 2020, but even if he doesn't, things are different now because of what he did well, and what you. you helped him do. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I also love comic books. Fifty years ago when I got my first job, a paper route, I used to spend all my money on comic books every week. <laughs> um, I have two questions for you. We've heard from Ed Schultz that uh, he used to be at MSNBC. He was in Burlington when Bernie announced Uh, made the formal announcement he was running for president, and he was called by Phil Griffin, the head of MSNBC, five minutes before his scheduled interview with Senator Sanders and told not to do it. So my first question is based on the previous caller who was a Hillary supporter and very hostile. What is Senator Sanders going to do differently to combat the toxicity of the Hillary people, the disinformation from the media, which we've heard a lot of this morning, and DNC cheating. And my second question is something that you did not mention in your book, which is that shortly, like a week or two before the California primaries, uh, they stopped doing exit polls, which was to me was one of the most suspicious things that happened during the primaries. And I would like to know what you know about that. So thank you very much for your work and for your answers. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't, you know, the exit poll issue, as folks who watched the 2016 race know, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion of a sense, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the methodology of exit polls, uh, how accurate they are uh, anyway. I know some of the networks who used to put money into them have pulled out and maybe trying to do something else. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, talk in the Bernie circles about the exit polls. Uh, and what they mean. You know, we had our own pollster uh, on the campaign. 
who did a phenomenal job, Ben Tulchin uh, out of California. And, um, you know, exit polls uh, have their problem. And, I, I, you know, I'm not a big fan of exit polls. They tend to overrepresent younger people uh, and more liberal people. And so you sometimes get a skewed uh, result of what the uh, result is going to be. I mean, I, I recall quite vividly, and this is, this is talked about in the book, you know, uh, the night of the New York primary, which was uh, we ended up losing to Secretary Clinton by, I think, 16 points. You know, the late exit polls had us losing by four, uh, which people in the media would have perceived as a huge victory for us uh, because it was her home state. Uh, and so I had media people calling me, congratulating me, only to uh, have to face the truth not long afterwards that, in fact, we had lost, I believe it was by 16. So, uh, you know, exit polling has, has its problems, and I think we're re-examining, or a lot of people are re-examining uh, how we uh, deal with that. In terms of the future, uh, you know, the DN issues of the DNC, as I mentioned, I think are being, hopefully being dealt with through this unity reform uh, process. Uh, there was a period in terms of the media, there's a lot of discussion about the media, people are interested in the media and how it intersects with presidential campaigns uh, and its impact. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of that in the book, particularly columnists and commentators and the role that they play uh, and played in the presidential campaign at the Washington Post, at the New York Daily News and other places where they really uh, work to sabotage uh, Bernie's uh, efforts. So if folks are interested in the media and the role it plays in politics, uh, I think you'll find the book uh, uh, to be of interest. Robert, Miramar Beach, Florida, line for Democrats. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, um, I'm was. i 77 years old, and I recently developed cancer. So I went to the VA at Pensacola, Pensacola and, um, to see a, a doctor there. And the doctor informed me that they aren't doing any more major surgeries there. They're outsourcing all that. So um, I got a call recently from the VA saying that I qualify for TRICARE. So I told the, the um, veteran um, this association that uh, my doctor's name. So they uh, called the doctor, and he said he doesn't accept this. So this privatization is not working. They're actually destroying the VA. If Why would you become a doctor to do surgery to go to VA if they're outsourcing it? Thank you. Well, you know, this is one of the issues. You, you know, if you want the VA to be vibrant, it has to have the capacity to provide the full range of care uh, that people need. And, you know, this is an issue, and this is an issue in private insurance in general is, uh, you know, you go to a doctor and the doctor maybe, maybe doesn't take your insurance, does take your insurance. Uh, this hospital does, that hospital doesn't. I mean, I personally I remember a number of years ago breaking my leg in an accident. I was thrown in an ambulance, taken to a hospital. Uh, it was quite a bad break, and I got into the hospital, had an x-ray, only to be told by my insurance company that I was at the wrong hospital, thrown back in the ambulance and taken to a different hospital. So I, I know firsthand uh, what the caller is uh, talking about. You were talking just a second ago about your concerns with the media and how it treated the, the Sanders campaign. Do you think the media has treated President Trump fairly? Uh, I mean, we could have a whole con hour-long conversation about the media and President Trump. I mean, you know, I think in many ways, uh, many in the media sort of play into his hands. He puts out a tweet in the morning, uh, and the media basically amplifies it for hours and hours and hours. And anybody who knows anything about Twitter, so Twitter is a little social media universe, which is sort of in and of itself, and the goal of people on Twitter is to try to get what they tweet to jump out into the mainstream media. That's its only relevance, because media people are on Twitter. Uh, but the president has no problem. He puts it up on Twitter. The media puts it up on TV. Every five minutes, we have hour-long discussions between pro-Trump and anti-Trump people. Meanwhile, the president's tweet gets amplified and amplified and amplified and amplified. So, you know, he's a master manipulator, uh, and in many cases, the media sort of walks right into it. Kansas City, Missouri. <coughs> Terry is a Democrat. Good morning. Hi. Um, I'm a Hillary supporter who worked on the Get Out the Vote effort, and I believe that if Instead of running, Bernie had enthusiastically supported Hillary. She would have won. Well, I, you know, I know there are people who hold that view. Uh, you know, the, the thing about it is, is at the end of the day, as I said earlier, voters have to be the one who make that decision. And in, in the Democratic primary in 2016, voters did choose Hillary Clinton. But that's not, you know, that, that's not to, to be preordained before we have a primary. You know, we're going to have another primary coming up in 2020. Bernie may run, he may not run. Others will certainly run. We're probably going to have a large Democratic field. Uh, and, you know, I think the voters should decide which of those candidates is going to be the Democratic standard bearer. I mean, you know, the truth is, if you talk to people in, in what I would call Obama world, people who were around President Obama in the 2008 uh, campaign, uh, many of them said, oh, Hillary Clinton should have gotten out long ago. And as you know, she went all the way to the end. She sued uh, to get delegates back that had been taken away because some states had run their processes uh, incorrectly. 
so this, you know, this complaint is uh, often lodged. Uh, in that case, they're more muted because President Obama ultimately did win. Uh, but if he had not won, I'm sure Secretary Clinton would have gotten tons of blame for why uh, she, she, she uh, caused him to lose. Just a couple minutes left. Sure. We'll try one or two more calls. Alan in Aaron, Tennessee, Line for Independence. Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to say that if uh, Bernie's going to be an independent and you run as an independent, you don't drain the money off the Democrats because you haven't been contributing to their funds. Every organization has to put money in. There's no doubt about it in this world nowadays. You've got to take a lot of money to run for president. Well, if you're going to be an independent, then don't upset what the Democrats. I bet the Republicans wish today they had a rule where Trump couldn't have ran. Thank you. Well, you know, Bernie Sanders that didn't take any money from the Democratic Party in his run for president. He was running in a primary. Uh, all of that money was raised at average contribution of $27 from grassroots uh, America uh, and a phenomenal and, and uh, moving uh, uh, display of generosity. Uh, and in fact, the Dem Bernie Sanders is a major uh, contributor to Democratic candidates up and down the ballot. You know, he is I, I'm going to put in well over $100,000 into the Vermont coordinated campaign, which is in states where, where you have elections, uh, you know, the Democratic Party, the Republicans do it as well. All the candidates will put money into a pool, which then benefits all the candidates. You know, he's a major funder of that, as he said, you know. Uh, Before you leave that funding, does, is that funding that's still left over from his presidential run? No, that, that is money in his uh, Friends of Bernie Sanders, which is his uh, Senate. That he continues to have. Yes, exactly. Uh, as I said, he's raised millions and millions of dollars for down-ballot uh, Democratic candidates and continues to do so. So uh, believe me, this, uh, his relationship with the Democratic Party is, I, I think, uh, if you talk to people who look at it objectively, would say it's a net positive for, for uh, the Democratic Party. Selena, Texas. Rick, independent. Go ahead. Yeah, I just got a question. I almost voted for Bernie, but when I did research on him, he, he really hasn't accomplished a whole lot in uh, being a politician. I only found that he was involved in three bills, and one of the bills he co-sponsored took toxic waste from where he was and put it in a little Texas town, a uh, little Hispanic Texas town where the average income was only 8000 I'm just wondering what else has he accomplished in government because, like I said, I liked what he was saying, but a lot of stuff he says I don't think it could ever get through Congress. But I considered voting for him, but when I researched him, I kind of find that's all I ever found that he accomplished in government. So what else has he accomplished? Jeff Weaver, you've got the last minute. Wow, well, that's good. That's good. And, and the book, I actually talk a lot about uh, this particular issue. You know, his work, work around Gulf War uh, illness, which was uh, uh, really a, a major, uh, you know, we don't use this word anymore, crusade on his part, along with uh, some others in Congress, to make sure that the veterans of the Gulf War uh, got the benefits that they uh, had earned through their uh, service. You know, in the House, he was called uh, the Amendment King because he passed more amendments by recorded vote uh, in a Republican House during his time there than any other member of Congress. Uh, and so, you know, there was a lot of narrative out there about Bernie didn't have a lot of legislative accomplishments, but uh, unfortunately they're all false, or at least unfortunately for his opponents. But if people want to read the book, there's a lot of discussion about his time in the Congress, uh, what he accomplished, uh, and how he moved the country forward. The book came out May 15th, How Bernie Won Inside the Revolution That's Taking Back Our Country and Where We Go From Here. Jeff Weaver is the author. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Thanks so much.